keep on, keep on, don't give up. It's like the preacher of Hebrews is a, a teammate running with you in the race. Or another traveler walking along the journey up the hill. Keep on, they say. Keep on going. Don't give up. Don't turn back. Don't stop now. Because there comes a, a point in many races and in many journeys where we want to give up. We've had enough. We're too tired. It's too far. It's too hard. I remember as a kid, we were just starting out on a long bushwalk up a mountain, and I was not keen at all to go. And my parents offered me and my siblings a Mars bar each. We could have it now. We have it now. Energy for the journey, a sugar hit to get us going at least. Or we could have it at the end, a reward for making it, a sweet sense of victory. Either way, we had to keep on walking. So which did I choose? Well, I'll come back to that later. Well, Hebrews 12, it, it repeatedly gives us the image of, of the race of faith and the journey of worship. And that's where we've been the last few weeks in Hebrews 12. And so now the writer says to the Christians of the first century and to us, keep on, don't give up. Remember those words from the start of chapter 12 we began, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And which ended last week with, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and all. How do we keep running with perseverance? How do we keep worshiping with reverence? Well, these six verses from Hebrews 13, they give us at least five practical ways to keep on going. But firstly, keep on loving the church family. Keep on loving the church family because your capacity to love is not running out. And secondly, don't forget to love strangers. Your responsibilities to them remain. And thirdly, continue to remember those in prison or suffering because you walk with them. And fourthly, to hold on to the value of marriage. Hold on to the value of sex because it's God's design. And the fifth one, to be free from loving money. To be content, not a consumer. With those five practical ways, really we can bring them down to three loves. And I'll, I'll show you why we can do that as we go along. Three loves. Love your sisters and your brothers. Love strangers. And do not love sex or money. Because this is the life. This is the race of faith. This is the life. This is the journey of worship that you're going on. So keep going. Keep on. Not giving up. Not, not running out. Not stopping. Not forgetting. And some people see chapter 13 as kind of a random attachment, a sort of appendix added to the end by some other author. It's perhaps it doesn't quite have the, the depth and the richness of other parts of Hebrews, but I think it makes up for that with relevant and powerful examples for everyday life. And for me, it makes, it makes perfect sense. It picks up on the themes of the rest of the book. It talks about commitment to the church family and perseverance in suffering and a call to holiness. And then it roots those ideas in Old Testament truth. It's just like the rest of the book. But this is one final exhortation to, to live by faith, to, to live in worship. Now, these practical applications, they, they move from what you could call the corporate in the first three verses to the individual in verses four to six. From the public to the personal. And when I first wrote that sentence during the week, I, I wrote from public to private. But right. That's not really a helpful idea from public to private. For, for the Christian, well, all of life is worship. We can't compartmentalize some aspects of life as private. Like it doesn't matter what we do in, in that area of our private lives. As long as like, we look like it's all together when we come here on Sunday. So tonight we're touching on some things that, that you might consider private. A marriage, sex, money... Your stuff, the stuff that you buy. 
But God wants to, God wants to speak into those private things and show the, their impact on the rest of your life and also on our lives together. And how we live our lives individually and together, it has to be shaped by who God is, by what He has done for us, by His promises for us. That's made clear in this passage in the Old Testament quotes in in verses 5 and 6. A a God who in His love and faithfulness will not leave us, will not forsake us. We are not alone. We're we're not abandoned. God is powerfully present. And it's not just that He's here, but that He is working. He is our helper, our protection and, and provision. We are not powerless, we're not panicked, but He is our unshakable hope. So while those things are explicitly stated, others lie beneath the surface of this passage. It's His love that shapes our love for one another. It's His walking with us, His dwelling with us that sets the example for walking with those in suffering. It's His holiness and justice that draws us to what is good and right in sex and in marriage. It's His generosity and provision that enables us to live a life of contentment. Hebrews 13 isn't moralistic. It's it's not about our striving. It's the response of worship. It's a, a reaction to who God is. It's the life of faith that trusts in God, living in light of His past actions and and His promises. So with that sort of introduction in mind, let's, let's look at the first love, to love your sisters and brothers. Verse 1 of chapter 13 is really only two Greek words, meno, which, which is to keep or, or to hold, to remain or abide, to continue or endure. It's all there in that one word. And then the second word is everyone's favorite cream cheese spread, Philadelphia. I think that's all it's known for, isn't it? It's in America as well, but that's all I can think of is cream cheese. And and Philadelphia is what we might call sibling or brotherly love. It's not about romance. It's not about a a ranking. It's, It's the love that should exist within a family. And we're intentional in this church in using the language of family here to remind ourselves of, of who we are to each other. And not just random people who meet for an event. This is a family gathering. And if you're new here, I hope you feel that too. You feel part of it. Now, that's why we do the monthly community dinner because we want to spend time together. We want to share a meal together, encourage one another, get to know one another. I was reading a, uh, my kids a book earlier this week. It's called Meerkat Mail. You can see where, this is where the meerkats are coming in. Uh, and it's the story of Sonny. Sonny's a, a meerkat with a heart for adventure. A meerkat with a heart for adventure. But there's a series of sort of unfortunate and, and, and traveling misadventures along the way. And Sonny realizes that he belongs home. He belongs to be at home. He belongs to be loved by his family. That's where he really wants to be. And what's the meerkat family's motto? Let's stay safe, stay together. Stay together. And if you've ever seen those massive emperor penguin huddles, they're cool. Meerkats, I feel like, take it to another level. And not in size, but in tenderness. It's a meerkat huddle, or or as I would say, it's a meerkat cuddle. Here's an example of one, so you know what I'm talking about. It's cute. It's cute. Hebrews 13.1 is is a reminder to the early church to stick together as family, to stay safe, stay together. Stay together. As they experienced persecution and suffering, as they clashed with the culture around them, as they learnt to follow the way of Jesus. Stay together. Keep on loving one another. Hold on to it. Continue with it. Abide in it. It's a persevering love that enables you to persevere. 
Because when things get hard, when the, when the pressure ramps up, it's easy to look inward, to, to focus on ourselves, to just try and get by. Community, or family even, evaporates when we get caught up in ourselves. And Jesus said there was no greater love than laying down your life for your friend. No greater love. Would we do that? Would we, would we do that for one another? Because that's what Jesus did for us. We've sung about it already. That he, he gave it all at the greatest cost to himself. He faced our suffering. He experienced our shame. He, he died our death. There's no greater love than laying down your life. So we, we are love. And he calls us to that same great love. It, uh, I feel like it's kind of, it's kind of like picturing a continuum. And at one end, you could say that there's a, a cup of coffee at one end. And at the other is lay down your life. He says, which is the greater love for a friend? Which is the greater love for a friend? A cup of coffee or to lay down your life? It's not about the quality of the person that you're loving, but the, the price that you're willing to pay, how much it's going to cost you. There is no greater love for a friend than to lay down your life. There's no greater love for your sisters and brothers here than to continually lay down your life, to keep giving it all, to, to give it all at great cost to yourself. So why is it that we don't do that? If that's what Jesus has called us to do. Why don't we love like that? Or maybe you're tired of trying. Tired of giving. Or maybe we're not actually that close and, and so we don't feel like we can. Or maybe we don't share how we're going so people don't even know our needs. Maybe we're overwhelmed. It's all too hard. It's all too much. Here are some practical tips. I'm sure you can think of many more. Here's just a few things I thought of. To be vulnerable. Be vulnerable with one another. To be honest and open with how we're going. Because it's really hard to guess. And I particularly, I'm not intuitively aware. It's hard to guess how you're going. So be vulnerable. Be open and honest. And listen to one another. There's, there's few things more loving than, than to be actually heard. We all want to be actually heard by someone. So be slow to speak. Slow to give advice. Slow to pass judgment. And listen. Make time for one another. Sundays are good. Life groups are good. But once a week, twice a week, that's not the church. That's not, that's not a real family. So do we make time for one another? And do we take time out? Because when the, the burden of loving one another, loving those around you, it, it can become overwhelming. Do, do we let the people know that we need some time out? Do, do you let me know so that then we can care for you? If you're doing all the loving, we want to care for you as well. Now, I'm sure you can think of more things, and if you do, just go and go ahead and do them. Don't ask for my, my permission to love one another. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And as we do that, in verse 2, it says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. In all our loving one another, don't forget to love the stranger. It's a contrast. It couldn't be clearer in the Greek. It's not so clear in English. The phrase, show hospitality to strangers, it's just one Greek word. Philozenia. Philozenia. And you're thinking, maybe that sounds familiar. It sounds a lot like Philadelphia. Philadelphia, it's a compound word. We're doing a little bit of Greek. We can do it together. Philadelphia, it's a compound word. The combination of philos, love, and adelphos, brother. And then you've got philozenia. It's another compound word. The combination of philos, love, 
and Xenos, stranger. Love the family, love the stranger. What happens on the inside should overflow. Love should be, should be visible in all of our relationships. And the writer of Hebrews adds a, a seemingly obscure reasoning that for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to, to angels without knowing it. It's likely to be a reference to Genesis 18 and 19, where, where Abraham and then and Lot, they show welcome and kindness to a couple of strangers they encounter, who turn out to be angels. It's a reminder to treat the stranger with love. To treat them with love is to treat them as worthy of it. Even before you know whether they're good enough for it, whether they deserve it, Treat them as worthy of it. Show hospitality without any preferences, without without playing any favorites. And so how do we express that? Well, we welcome people who are new to church, invite them in. We look out for people who might feel like they're sitting on the fringe. And we show the same care and compassion whether we know people well or, or whether we don't. Why not open our homes to have people over? And go out of our way to invite people into our social plans who we wouldn't usually. Look for ways to extend your love to those you don't know. know, Pick a charity, pick a local cause. You could donate to our community assistance fund. If you want, you can come with me to deliver those grocery vouchers to families in need. And just this past week, I, I visited... Two families who had contacted our church and no connection to us. We just blessed them without asking for anything in return. We love the stranger. As we love the church. And and how do we do that? In what way do we do that? Verse 3 says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. In it of itself, it's fairly self-explanatory there. I think it's the as-ifs that make it interesting. Remember those in prison as if you were together with them. Literally as if you were bound together or bound with them. This is quite a stark image. If one is chained and locked up, well then, we all are. They are not alone. They're not abandoned. We remember them by connecting ourselves to them. Now, before you run out and do it, I don't think this was a command to go and chain yourself to the prison door or to find some way to get arrested too. I don't think that's what it's talking about. It's encouraging us to, to join our, our lives to them, to join our hearts to them, join our hopes to them. Because we're used to distancing ourselves, perhaps my generation more. We're creating space between us and, and them. We do it so that we don't get hurt or, or so that we don't get overwhelmed. We're used to compartmentalizing and and categorizing people, putting people in boxes, so we don't have to get too involved with them or so we don't have to care about them. Hebrews 13 goes deeper, though, with the second as if. It says, And remember those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. It's literally as you yourselves are in the body. Experience the mistreatment of others as if it was your body. Now, it could be talking about the church as a whole, as a body, as a metaphor. The New Testament does that elsewhere. But more common, and certainly in the book of Hebrews, is for the body to mean the physical body. Just as Jesus came in flesh and bone incarnate, and his body suffered physically on our behalf. 
And so we also share in the sufferings of one another. You could say we move from, from sympathy to empathy. The sympathy acknowledges someone else's story. Empathy accepts that it's real. The sympathy sees their pain. Empathy feels it. About 10 years ago, my wife Mez had been uh, battling chronic fatigue for years. And it got to the point where she tried so many things, so many doctors, so many diets, so many tests. And her doctor at the time said that she should, she should just take some drastic action. There's no prognosis here, but you need to take action. It would take a year of rest. A year of rest. No more managing your energy. No more balancing work and social and church commitments. No more trying to just make do. Take a year. Quit your job. Cancel your social plans. Don't go to church. Don't go to the shops. Don't even go for a walk down the street. Essentially, put your life on hold. Give up this one year for the sake of the next 60. It seemed like a crazy idea. And most people couldn't understand. Most people didn't know what to say. Can't you just like, like sleep more? Isn't that how you solve chronic fatigue? Just sleep more. Or have you tried X, Y, or Z? You don't look that sick. Most people couldn't understand. It, it was a hard year. It was a, a lonely year. A necessary year. I brought it up with Mez this week as I was thinking about this sermon. and It brought back a bunch of memories for her. One of them was her asking her doctor right at the start. She said to him, well, what about my friends? What about my friends? The doctor said, your friends will visit. They'll make time. Your friends will, will take a day off work to come and see you. And by and large, they didn't. They didn't go out of their way to be there for her, to be there with her. It didn't cost them anything. Now, there's much more to this story, uh, and I don't tell it for sympathy. I'm not looking for your sympathy, and neither is Mez. I asked Mez whether I could share it tonight because it so pointedly shows the way that we struggle to enter into other people's pain. I also don't share this as an expert because I lived with her. It was just the two of us and I found it hard to walk with her. We struggle to be bound with someone who is suffering, to be in the body with them. When people share that they are hurting or grieving or depressed or lonely, uh, I know it can be hard to know what to say. Often we, we end up deflecting with a statement like, well, at least, at least it wasn't worse. Or at least you've still got this other thing. Or worse yet, we tell the story of the time something vaguely related happened to us. Oh, you had a miscarriage? You lost a baby. Uh, yeah, I lost my phone the other week. Don't worry, I found it again. Oh, you're experiencing chronic pain? Yeah, I had a sore knee the other week. I think it was from playing soccer. Well, your, your friend passed away. Yeah, one of my indoor plants died recently. So sad. Sometimes it's better to say nothing. I really hope no one said any of those statements, by the way. I'm caricaturing it slightly, but it's, sometimes it's better to say nothing. But sometimes it's just better to remind them that you're there, that you want to be with them, and that you'll walk with them, no matter how deep, no matter how dark it may get. You step into their story as if you were bound to them, as if it's your body. Now, I'm not suggesting we take on their burden. We don't take on their burden. We just sit with them in it. We pray for God to lift it. 
We remind them that they are not alone. And it doesn't mean that we make their problem our problem. We just choose to be with them, to be bodily in it. We pray for God to fix it. And we remind them that they are not abandoned. We have a Father who made us, who knows us and loves us, our our protector, our provider. We have a Savior who steps into our situation walking before us, walking beside us. And we have a spirit that dwells within us, comforting us and encouraging us along the way. And so because of that, because of that, we love our brother and sister. We love the stranger. We, we connect ourselves and we commit ourselves to them. Now that's verses 1 to 3. And now verse turns to, to what we might call more, more personal matters. A marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now, there's probably a whole sermon in just that one verse. Well, let me just point out a few things. Now, firstly, the, the first line is actually a chiasm, A-B-B-A, Abba, if you want to remember how it goes. Honored, marriage should be, the marriage bed kept pure. That's how it's written in the Greek. And what that does in, in, in putting it together like that is to point out that marriage and sex are intimately linked. Even though so, society and, and our culture and maybe even our own hearts have tried to divorce them. God has designed them together. Marriage to be honored, to be held sacred, to be greatly valued. The marriage bed to be kept pure, to be held sacred, to be uncorrupted. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to remember to value what God values. Those who use marriage or use sex for other than he intended, well, they will ultimately face him. The encouragement then well, is, is to save sex for the committed covenantal relationship of marriage. A one that is, is selfless and self-sacrificing, self-giving. Because there is a, a giving of yourself in sex. It has, a, it has a bonding effect. But if you've failed to honor marriage, if, you've, if you haven't kept sex pure... Well, that doesn't mean that you're damaged. And maybe you've heard that youth group paper and glue analogy. The youth pastor gets up the front and, and explains that you are like a piece of paper and sex is like glue. And, and when you stick yourself to someone and, and then tear away, it, it rips you apart. A piece of you remains with them. Now, I get that that could be a helpful analogy. Could be. I mainly see the harm, though, because you are not some object, just a piece of paper. And you are not torn apart and, and worthless. But you have messed up God's design. You have not honored the value that He has given it. And so He will be the judge. He will be the judge. Not me, not you. So I'm not here to judge you. But I will, as Hebrews does, encourage you to take sex and marriage seriously. And if you know that you're not honoring it right now, well then stop and seek God's forgiveness. Let Him transform your heart. Let Him transform your actions. And like many parts of the Bible, Hebrews brings sex and money together. It's there in the Ten Commandments and in Paul's letters to the, the Corinthian and the Ephesian and the Colossian church. It's there. It's in our lives we can end up being driven by desire and lust. Consuming and coveting, whether we're talking about sex or money. Consuming and coveting. Hebrews 13 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. 
literally not loving money. This is the third compound word in the passage. Aphilaguros. Ah, it's just the negative. Philos there for a third time in this passage, love. And aguros, money. Not loving money. This loving money is enslaving. It it captures our our thoughts and our plans. It, It takes over our time. The freedom is found in contentment. It's a quiet confidence. It's a peaceful dependence. A humble reliance. Confident of what? Peaceful why? Reliant on, on who? God says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. No matter our experience, unloved or unwelcome, no matter our circumstance, whether shackled or suffering, we are not alone, we're not abandoned, not helpless, not afraid. Whether in marriage or with our money, whether we're talking about sex or whether we're talking about all our stuff that we've accumulated. God is with us. God is enough. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. So back to my Mars bar. As I climbed that mountain as a kid, did I smash it right at the start? Did I savor it at the end? I chose to have it now. I wanted it now, and I ate it. Tiny bite by tiny bite. No sugar rush. I savored every minuscule little taste. Three hours later, we reached the destination, and I reached the end of my fun-sized Mars bar. My parents' plan worked. I kept going. Last quote in verse 6 of of Hebrews 13. It's from Psalm 118. It's the last of the Thanksgiving Psalms. And it's particularly concerned with, with God's protection and His provision in times of suffering. A Psalm of Thanksgiving about a time of suffering. There's one recurrent chorus throughout it all. It says, His love endures forever. And we sing it as we run the life, the race of persevering faith. And we sing it as we live a life of reverent worship. Our love wavers and fails, but His love endures forever. Our suffering, it feels like forever, though it will fade. But His love endures forever. Marriage and money, sex and stuff, it's all fleeting. But His love endures forever. So keep on. Keep on the race of faith. Keep on the journey of worship. Why? Because his love keeps on. His love endures forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he steps into our story. And Lord, would we be changed by that? The way that we have been loved, would we show that same love to our brothers and sisters here to the strangers. And Lord, would we continue to trust you, trust your design for how we should live, trust you for our provision, not, not relying on the money and stuff that we could accumulate. 
God, help us to keep on going. With our eyes fixed on you, knowing that knowing that you keep on going. You endure forever. Your love endures forever. So Lord, help us to trust that and walk in that truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.